Well, eleven times I've been in jail. I'm not, brag- I'm not bragging about that at all. But uh, in one time, uh, Gary and I was just having a little bit of drunk in front in a bar, and they put us in jail for public intoxication. And while we were sitting there, you know, we didn't have nothing to do except wait for somebody to get us out, you know. We were just sitting there, and I said, Gary, you know, how many times have you been put in jail? You know, he said, um, two or three times, I guess. I said, you know what? I was counting them up. This is 11 times I've been there. He said, you know, you're just double trouble, Ronnie. You know, you're just... A... There you go. <laughs> there you go. We'll write a song about that. But before we could get this thing released, I got uh, thrown in jail for protecting Billy Powell, the keyboard player. And actually, I should change the words when I sing it live now. Instead of starting off 11 times I've been busted, I should say a dozen times I've been busted. <laughs> Gary, Alan, and myself, the two guitar players that are with us, and, and myself, uh, started back at the end of this year, 1976. We'll be 12 years. And uh, we just played pubs and clubs and uh, for about, God, what, eight, nine years. And uh, we finally were playing a club in Atlanta, Georgia, called Finocchio's, where we ran into a gentleman called Al Cooper from New York who was real knocked out over the band. And we didn't have anything going for us, no record uh, deals or anything, but Al really loved the band, and um, he had just signed with MCA to form his own company, Sounds of the South Records, and uh, he asked us to go with him. And uh, at the time, we we didn't have anything else going for us, so we we took it, you know. And... um, Later on, uh, MCA, Al signed a, a, a lot of groups for his label, and uh, none of them went well, you know, except us. So MCA uh, company dropped Sounds of the South, you know, eliminated them and eliminated all the groups and then snatched us up and carried us straight to their label, their major label. I guess the question to go with the first album is a song, and if I remember correctly, the last time we talked, which was quite a few years ago, quite a lot of records in between, I remember asking you about Freebird. And I remember at the time you said to me something like, wow, you know how long we've been doing that song? Well, I'm sure you're still doing it, and it's quite a, lo- a lot longer than the last time. And um, tell me about the song. What's, what's, how did it come about, <laughs> and how long have you really been doing it? We've actually been doing that particular song, uh, I can't think exactly when we wrote it, but I know it was at least seven to eight years ago. And uh, Alan Collins, a guitar player, wrote it. And uh, he wanted to write it. First of all, we was writing it as a slow song, a pretty song. And, and I was doing the singing, the slow part and all. And then Alan, Alan came up with the idea of changing the tempo right in the middle of where it's slow just to come up with an accent that would lead it up and then to build a rhythm pattern that would be just free form for a guitar player to play, you know. And uh, he designed all the guitar work and and all the the rhythm section, all the music, and I just wrote the lyrics, which is the simplest thing in the world. And uh, we started playing it in clubs and on, and and back seven or eight years ago, like I said, it it didn't work too much. They wanted to hear on, they wanted to hear knock on wood and midnight hour and stuff. and we would play that song in clubs, and because they said it wasn't a good dance song, uh, we'd get a lot of booze on it and things thrown at us and turn it down and all that. But uh, when you're playing in a club, you play uh, usually four sets a night, four 45 minute sets a night. So instead of throwing the song away because it wasn't so successful, we kept it for one reason that uh, we'd play Freebird at least twice a night, which would give the singer give myself uh, a little bit of breather, you know, and uh, <clears throat> we taped it once, like just over what you got right here, and it uh, it sounded pretty good to us. So when Al Cooper did sign us and we went to Atlanta to record, we we decided to show him the song. You know, he, well, he had heard us play it in the clubs before, and we decided to see what it'd sound like on on record, you know, and uh, worked out really fine. 
that uh, everybody just loves that song for some reason. I, I don't know the reason, but I guess it's just because it's got such a high energy thing at the end. And it's, it's very simple. It's a very simple song. I've talked to other musicians about it. But how do you, that'd be really hard for us to work out, but if they can count to four, they can play that song. And uh, it's just uh, a number of changes that you count so many changes and then you change and make it faster. And uh, Alan, because he designed it, just runs it. And uh, it, it's worked so much that we've never been able to, to write a song that would come up with as much energy and, and, and get the people off as much as that song has. So we must end up with it, you know, because if we play it the first song, then uh, we can't have that much energy the rest of the set. You know what I mean? Looking back at the first album, what other songs come to mind that you can think about in their recording and such? I definitely think that the first album was the best. Myself, there's other members in the group that disagree. Some of them like Second Helping the best. Uh, everyone in the band just about agreed that uh, Nothing Fancy was probably our poor showing, but it was simply because as the record companies were putting so much pressure on us that we didn't have time to really sit down and think about it. And now with this album, there's much more enthusiasm over this album than there is the, the first one. But uh, I think the first album had better selection of material, much more variety. And the reason for that is, is eight years of club work, and uh, we had a lot more time to think about it. You know? So when we got a chance to do our first album, we, we actually we had 20 songs that we recorded and just picked eight you know, that we thought would work. When we did that, we brought in other people, such as the line rhythm section and uh, every musician that we thought was good friends of ours and would give us a true opinion, and that's how we drew the eight songs, and fortunately it worked. When we did our first album, we, we had 20 songs to choose from, and uh, we picked eight to go on the um, first one, pronounced Leonard Skinner, and several songs. Um, with the exception of a couple like Alabama and uh, Working for MCA, uh, which were newer songs, uh, basically it was drawn from the songs we didn't use on the first album. And we had a lot of material to think of at the time. But when it came down to nothing fancy, it, MCA said they wanted the album, and Peter Rudge came to us and said, I've got to have an album. And we just came off of a tour. We was very tired, and we went into the studio. We had no idea what we was going to do. We had nothing planned out, so it was just a matter of staying in there almost 24 hours a day and trying to write songs, you know. And consequently, uh, I'm just speaking for the group, the whole group thing, that this probably was our first, uh, our worst showing, but I won't argue with gold, you know. Sweet Home Alabama was the first hit single, yeah. and you wrote that, as I've read, uh, based on a song that Neil Young did entitled Alabama. Is that uh, sort of just a, a comical answer to what Neil did? Exactly, exactly. It, it, it was, I uh, just did an interview and I just told them too that Alabama, <clears throat> on second helping, um, we came up like a song short and so we put Alabama together. Really, what happened, this just happened the spur of a moment thing. It took exactly about eight hours to write and we just started from scratch and just had fun with the song, and when Second Helping came out, we never decide which which song will be the single because uh, we're not capable of doing that. Um, people like right here, is, who knows the, the business a lot more, will know what's going to happen on radio. We don't. And uh, so the first choice to come off the second album was a song called um, Don't Ask Me No Questions which they thought would be very much commercial, and, and it didn't work. And so many months later, as a last resort to help pick the album back up, they stuck out Alabama, and uh, which picked the album up very much, and it was a hit. We thought, we thought when they put it out that it might do well in the South, you know, and especially it might do well in Alabama because, you know, they would say, well, there's somebody sticking up for us after somebody's put us down, but they had done well all over the country, and we were very surprised about that. Nothing fancy uh, when you did it. It was a, a rush thing, like, let's get yeah, it done real it. fast. We recorded it, we mixed it, we did it all within 20-something days, which 
<clears throat> is, is a long time. They used to do albums in in a one session, you know. But uh, we're not capable of doing that, and I don't think many groups nowadays are. But <clears throat> yeah, well, it was a real rush job, and really rushed. It was mixed poorly, and uh, wasn't the, the best thing that we ever put out at all. But there were some good spots on it, I thought. But what, what were they? Well, I, th I thought Saturday Night Special, which we put out, was done really well. Although I don't know, that might just have been a follow-up from Alabama. You know, it's different over here um, in, in in England and over in Europe. This album was respected as much as our first one. You know, so it's just a matter of opinion, really. But as speaking for the group, we just thought if they hadn't been, if we hadn't had that much pressure on us at the time, we could have done. We didn't have 20 songs to choose from at that time. As soon as we finished these, we left the album. So f finishing a third album, was it once again out on the road and do some more touring? Or did you have time to sort of sit back and reflect and work on a fourth album? When, of course, Give Me Back My Bullets. The, the latest one, we did take much more time. Uh, to tell you the truth, not as much time as we'd like. But in this business, I can't name you too many groups that, who do get enough time to to do that because you just got to keep doing it or the public will forget you, you know. What was it like recording this time under a more relaxed situation? This was the most pleasant album that we've, we've ever did. Usually we have a lot of arguments, and it's not because of the reputation of Leonard Skinner. If you go into any session with a, with a group, there's going to be arguments, you know. And people are just going to get mad because they can't get a part right or something and uh, they want to stay with it and they're wasting time and uh, working with Tom Dowd he never let any pressure get to us well, for one thing he never allowed people in the studio you know he never allowed no one in there He's, when you come to work I want you here at nine o'clock in the morning and you come ready to work don't bring you no chicks with you you know and if you bring your bottle you wait for a while till you start drinking you know you you're going to do it exactly the way I do it. Because he said he made it very perfectly clear to us and he didn't need us and he don't need anybody. And if he, we wanted to do the album, we'd do it the way he wanted to do it. He wouldn't mess with our music, but he would take control of us and get the best out of us. And he very definitely done that. And uh, it's probably, I think, maybe we've got more commercial stuff on it than uh, any, anything that we ever did before. But... Uh, Doing the album was just a great time. Never once did I feel any pressure. There's several songs. Um, Every Mother's Son. I've got the same old blues, J.J. Kale song. Um, Roll, Gypsy Roll. I, I did that the first shot, you know, just went in while the band was playing. With the, we're using not a special mic, which they usually use to get a great quality on. You know, when you get ready to do a, a vocal part, they uh, figure out what type of voice you're in that day and then figure out what mic to use on you. And I just used any old hand mic and uh, Tom went with it, you know, just the pilot vocal, what we call the pilot vocal, because he said it had a lot of feel, you know. He said he felt that I sang better while the whole group was playing instead of going out there by myself, you know, and after everything was done, you know. Let's talk about some of the songs. Uh, okay, I can see um, Cry for the Bad Man, which was written, uh, I won't give you his name because he might make a suit, a, a, a gentleman we did business with one time, and uh, he really messed us over, he cost us a lot of money, and uh, he was a money miser and he cheated us really bad, and finally we got out from under contracts with him, and I, so I figured to write a song about him, and that's Cry for the Bad Man. Now, all I can do is write about it in a song is, is about uh, where we live, there's, you know, it's really pretty there. You still, you got the Okefenokee Swamp, excuse me, and you got uh, Everglades and all that stuff, but in, in the song, it, it, uh, I say that uh, I can see the concrete slowly creeping, you know, and uh, that means that the business, for instance, us people from Florida, 
really don't consider Miami to be part of Florida anymore. And uh, I can see that they're, you know, it's just they're just going to build a Holiday Inn in the Finocchi Swamp one day. And uh, the, all I'm seeing in this song is, Lord, take me in mind before that comes, because I don't want to see it happen, you know. Leave it be. It's a beautiful, beautiful place, and don't bother with it. You know? I try to write about uh, places I've seen, things that I've done, um, Normal things, things that you've done, really, or things that you know about. And I think if you write it really simple, you know, uh, then you can reach more people that way because more people's going to understand what you're talking about. You know what I mean? Let me ask you, uh, you are suffering from jet lag, as you mentioned earlier. You've just completed a, a uh, European tour. You're about to set out again to conquer the United States. It must be pretty rough going like that uh, from day to day. All this touring, and you're really a touring band. Does it get to you after a while? Yeah, we, we get on edge uh, all the time. You know, that's... We get a lot of publicity about busting up place and being really mean or something like that, but uh, you just get really tired, you get really nervous, and you're about to just flip out and go over the deep end and just say, the hell with it, I quit. Well, instead of doing that, we just lob and knock a hole in the wall or any way to let, let energy off, you know, settle down. And uh, once we do that, we get it out of our system. And, uh, we get a lot of publicity about that, the who do. But uh, I know a lot of bands, I won't mention their names, that do a lot worse than both of the groups I just mentioned. But they don't get the publicity about it. You know. All of them do it, really. <laughs> it's a way to let it off. It's also a tax write-off. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, in closing, uh, what are your future recording plans, especially in light of all that touring? Hmm. Well, within the next three months, we will be doing a live album. A live one, which is what we've been waiting for for a long time. And... Uh, Looking very forward to that. Tom Dowd is going to do that. We're going to do it in Atlanta, Georgia. We're going to do it at Fox Theater, a small place where, where we can get a really good sound. We're going to rehearse for three days with Tom and all the people that we're going to use with us to do it live. Then we're going to do one week of playing in, in Atlanta at the Fox and pick the best of what we got. You know. In other words, we're not going to make no money off no live album. <laughs> spend a lot on doing it, but I think if you're going to make a live album, you should do it like the Allman Brothers did live at the Fillmore East or something. Very few live albums sound good, you know, but Mr. Dowd is very, very good at doing live stuff, you know, and uh, we got the best people behind us. We got the best record company. We got the best producer. We got the best uh, manager. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think I got one of the best bands behind me, and it's just going to be a lot of fun doing, doing it. Sure sounds it. Listen, thanks a lot, and best of luck, Ron. Best of luck. Yeah, thank you very much.